my intention is that we would talk about uh, your career arc and how it's gone. And specifically, okay. there's uh, kind of a, you know, you, you get to senior engineer and there's often kind of a lull in most people's careers at senior right. engineer, partly because it's not clear what comes next. Right. Like, it's not that you, you can't just keep being a more and more senior individual contributor, but at most places, that's not a really well-defined path. And most places don't even want to promote you that way. I mean, if there's, if there's two career ladders, if there's sort of the manager and the individual uh, career mm -hmm. ladder, um, <clears throat> you wind up, uh, if, if, you know, after the first couple of times, you, you wind up asking them, so tell me, how many people have ever actually been promoted above senior mm -hmm. engineer level on that other ladder? Because the answer is usually like one, and, it, and we had to give him something to keep him from quitting. <laughs> um, and I don't think there's, there's so much one obvious uh, answer to that as um, there's not an obvious answer. And so talking to a bunch of people is a good way to kind of get a feel for all the, all the partial answers we've all individually found. So tell me about how long you've been doing this whole software developer thing. Long story short is I should probably be a lot further along than I am, if only for the fact that I had a leg up on this stuff that not a lot of people had. My father is a software engineer who has been practicing since the 70s. And growing up with it, I um, took a couple of runs at trying to learn it and just got frustrated and found it to be kind of um, hard to get my head wrapped around when I was a kid. Um, and I was much more interested in doing things that felt more immediately gratifying. Um, I didn't come back into it until much later on when I was going back to school for music and bought a computer to start doing music production. And then also realized that I wasn't bad at Adobe and all that other stuff. And then realized everybody else in that industry was also getting computerized and that studio jobs it was like a great way to spend a lot of time gaining technical skills that actually didn't pay that well and and where more people wanted to do the job than there were jobs so um but every time my computer would break like the internet was now a thing so i would it, it was actually how i started really discovering that i actually thought the computer itself was interesting and so years later i realized i just wasn't making anything like the money i could be for somebody who you know, is, is kind of a restless thinker. So I decided to give programming another shot and I put myself back through school and got a couple of associates degrees. Um, still don't have a, uh, bachelor's of CS. Uh, so for example, I'm not very good at, uh, situations like big go notation. Um, I've never taken a comprehensive data structures class, et cetera, et cetera. But I did talk my way into, uh, a consulting shop that hired me and threw me in the deep end and kind of hung onto the job by my fingernails for the first year or so. <laughs> and, um, and just kind of, you know, and I pick, so I picked up rails, um, and I picked up some iOS development around iOS five, iOS six. So I ended up learning objective C and doing some native development that way. Um, and then a few years later, I ended up hopping, uh, to the other major rails shop in Omaha, which is uh, flywheel. And they promised me I wouldn't have to work in PHP, even though we're a WordPress host and, uh, you know, and I, I kid, but, uh, you know, like it's actually grown in market share since I joined the company. It's, I think now a third of the internet runs on or websites runs on WordPress. So PHP is huge. PHP is yeah. absolutely enormous and it's not shrinking. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think to a certain extent it like it it even though I don't spend a lot of time actually doing WordPress, like like the that community makes a little bit of sense to me because it feels like we're you know, WordPress has transcended PHP in a lot of the same way that, you know, Rails has sort of transcended Ruby. It's I think it's more common to find Rails engineers than people who just solve tons of problems in vanilla Ruby. Yeah, certainly so, in the English speaking world. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um but my Japanese is terrible, so I, I'm probably not going to compete for <laughs> for a lot of those other jobs. So yeah, I've been doing it. Um, I'd say I went full time. Um, I'd, I'd say I went full time as a, a software developer sometime in 2012, and just kind of like towards the end of 2012. And um, about about the same time I wrote the uh, first book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I ended up spending a lot of time just kind of really 
just being thrown into different tons of different greenfield projects where we were trying to get stuff out the door before the startup we were working for ran out of money. And then we turned around and landed on a company that was literally three, three people in somebody's living room and turned into one of the fastest growing companies in Nebraska. Nice. And, um, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, uh, I've just ended up spending my free time, uh, doing music. I've gone through spates of really trying to do more programming for fun on the sides and I'll have ideas here and there that I really like, but, um, it's just, I think the problem is I'm just one of those people that's just, uh, constantly tempted by new projects and finds seeing one through to completion to be kind of a challenge. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the brief history of my career so far. Uh, but I run a, uh, a, a co-run a, a, a small, uh, Ruby, uh, meetup. Um, and we're beginning to see some buy-in again. Uh, the company that I work for now is like really, we're, we're finally getting, um, really open to remote hiring. Um, and all it took was, you know, all it took <laughs> was, um, everybody needing to work from home. Uh, no, but I mean, uh, that's really, we're, we're reaching out to the broader community. We're trying to grow the language here. We're actually working with the other largest shop, the other largest uh, Ruby shop in Omaha to try to actually, uh, train new hires together. So instead of like competing for each other, we're trying to work together in a, in a good way. Um, yeah. Well, that's great for me to hear. I mean, I'm, I'm in Inverness, which has a tiny technical community and, and I'm, yeah. you know, look, looking at what we can do to sort of grow the community, the Ruby community here. So that, that's good to hear. That's good to know. Um, but yeah, no, I work for with some of the smartest Rubyists uh, I've ever met, um, like Michael Harold. Uh, he's the <laughs> Hashi maintainer, uh, much to his constant chagrin. He'd, he'd really like everyone to stop using that jam anytime now. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, uh, uh, Adam Lassick, uh, fantastic developer. Um, you know, uh, uh, Tony Knacker, our CTO is a classic person who's happiest with his headphones on building things. Um, you know, nice. and we have a pretty aggressive, no jerks policy. So if we don't think you can play well with others, you just, we just don't let you back in the building. So like everybody on our team is really uh, pretty, pretty generous and, and easy to, easy to work with. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that makes sense. Can you talk a little about what you think the inflection points were in your career? Maybe you changed titles. Maybe you just started doing more. Maybe you got more responsibility. But where are the points where you would say what you did had a kind of a qualitative change in, in how well you were doing it and, and how much people trusted you to do it? Hmm. Um, I'd say... Uh... Almost any of them, um, the thing they have most of in common is that, um, you know, I started asking forgiveness. I know it's a, it, it's a, it's a cliche, but it was, there were times when I stopped asking for permission and just started more asking for forgiveness. So, you know, going out and finding a few clients right after, um, I graduated just to kind of keep paying the bills while I look for better work, um, realizing that I liked Ruby a lot more than Java and then just trying to find some place to work that was doing that. Um, uh, Omaha is a class kind of enterprisey town in the sense that like we have kind of a, a mid-sized developer community, but it's a lot of people doing .NET and Java and, you know, not really participating in an open source as much and kind of punching the clock and going home is kind of, I guess, the, the, the unfair type. So, you know, it was going to be very easy for me to find work doing Java, but I, I just wanted to work in Ruby instead just because I like doing it. And that was... That was helpful. Uh, uh, anytime at the consulting company where I could step up more away, f more things off other people's plates were, were, were times that were good for me. Um, you know, basically like really just kind of getting out in front of high, high maintenance customers and saying, just, just direct your questions to me. You know, those, those kinds of things. Um, yeah. And um, honestly, anytime I've paid attention to speaking i'd say some um uh, the 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 projects i built here and there that were driven by something else were the ones that were the most likely to succeed whether it was like building a demo app for a talk i wanted to give or just you know building something ahead of time to short circuit a technical interview just to say like here just look at this repo sure 
Cool. <clears throat> now that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, a lot of my best stuff has been the stuff that, uh, that I thought about how to present it to other people and then I built it. So it sounds, it sounds kind of similar. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And the, the times where I go in and like, just, it's a blank piece of paper, I think are the times I'm the least useful, you know? Um, uh, I remember a friend buying a raspberry Pi B off a friend of mine and just being like, Oh, this great. It's a single board computer and I can get these and I can go home and just have all this fun with this thing. And I got all the way to the point where it SSH'd into it and was just looking at the blinking prompt and just going, now what? Like I, I literally just, it was like, it was like writer's block. Like I, I couldn't think of anything I wanted to do with it. But when the pie hole project came out, while I was very concerned about privacy, then I had that working in half an afternoon. And it was kind of, it was rewarding to pull the dashboard up and watch all these little requests from my Roku to phone home and send my network activity back to some data miner just getting blocked and thinking okay wow that really did something that makes a lot of sense uh, so uh, I, I haven't actually asked you about this but uh, mm. have you done much uh, interviewing other people for your company have you done any significant amount of being sort of on the hiring side of the table in interviews I, I actually have on both of the last two companies I've worked for um, it, but I tend to get pulled in in terms of um at looking for a read on people so i tend to be the person who you know they'll they'll bring in uh, um to just look at people for culture fit um fortunately at my company it's i'm it's i'm i, I am neither the only person nor am i the only nor am i uh nor is it three other people that look like me like we're we're really trying to do a very good job of trying to be very inclusive and to broaden the number of perspectives and sure. experiences on our team. So, but I guess, um, yeah, but I guess, uh, uh, they, they like the read on people that I, I bring to the table. So I'll do that. Um, and yeah, generally we're, I'm looking for attitude. I'm looking for somebody who's, um, um, like, Okay, so before I got hired at the consulting shop, uh, a friend of mine and I um, figured out that we could buy um, a plat a streaming uh, on-demand capability, and we could populate it with MP3 files, and we could hook that up to Squarespace. Like basically, we kind of realized, like over a couple of long lunches and a couple of evenings, we figured out we could build a streaming radio station that played nothing but music from people from Omaha. Um, That's cool. And yeah, it's like I grew up in Memphis, which is a town known for music. And then I moved to Omaha, which is a town that's not known for music besides a couple of indie bands that managed to hit escape velocity. And I just thought that's a shame because we had so many good, uh, good musicians. And um, so we did this. We built it. We built it up uh, because HTML5 was a thing. Um, I was able to get the streaming stuff playing right in mobile Safari without an app on an iPhone, you know. And I think we ended up shutting it down about a year later, like as a business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't sound like something that would be easy to make money off. Yeah, it was, it was, we were trying to connect with local advertisers and do all this stuff. And the problem was we were, we were launching all this at the time. I was the only person between us and we were launching at a time when Pandora and RDO were starting to get really popular. So people were looking for dynamic playlists and all this other stuff. And, um, but my, my, my friend Josh, who'd worked with me, got hired on as the marketer for a local coffee roaster. And that was part of what got my foot in the door at the consulting shop. So it was just like, it was like, you know, I, it, it was more important that I'd tried to do something than that it had been some sort of a roaring success. And I find that that's kind of what I look for in other people, just people that are trying to try different stuff and not be deterred when they hit resistance and, and move forward until something sticks. That makes sense. Uh, I forget who I'm quoting, but the whole uh, success consists of moving from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Ab absolutely. <laughs> cool. That makes sense. Um, all right. So it sounds like you don't do a lot of kind of enforcing the company's idea of the coding bar. Uh, you, you know what I mean? I'm not sure if I'm saying this right. Oh, well, I'm like, so I'm not going to be the person who's going to do technical interviewing, but, uh, but I do spend a lot of time working with people that are less experienced, um, in terms of like trying to like, you know, uh, uh, trying to help people, um, think about 
at least just some basic ideas about code design so that you don't get blame something in six months and then, <laughs> you know, who wrote this crappy, you know, it's not that bad. I'm sure there were <laughs> extenuating circumstances. Of the no, and they're just like talking about basic ideas like, you know, encapsulation or not using active record callbacks when you don't have to, or you know, things yeah. like that. Uh, that makes sense. Are, yeah. Um, and that's because t I think teaching is ultimately a selfish act. It really benefits the teacher a lot. And so communicating these ideas helps me understand them better. So when you're interviewing somebody who's in a, a, a senior engineer or, or higher role, what do you mm. look for? What, what, do, what do you look for in a person like that? What, what's a good one instead of a bad one? Mm. Um, honestly, so when you're dealing with somebody at that level, I think you are you are dealing with a situation where interpersonal skills actually become incredibly critical um, because in, in senior engineers have an outsized effect on the organization. And um, what, what can launch your career trajectory early can end up causing problems later on. If, if, if you're a prolific cowboy coder, for example, like you can make a huge, like you can slap together a huge, barely functional mess really, really quickly. And you're also clever enough to pack it all back in your head and keep making modifications to it. But then the next person that comes along doesn't know where to, which part of the Rube Goldberg machine to start with. That's um, a really good way to put it. That causes, uh, that can cause a problem for a team situation as well as it, being able to know how to communicate effectively with people that are less, um, that are less uh, technically competent. That's the other major shortcoming I've seen. Um, um, people that are really, really smart um, and are used to thinking of themselves as the smartest person in the room are prone to a particular collection of problems that I don't see in other people. And the number one, is, the number one problem is that they adopt positions they can't be talked out of. That's a and, that's another excellent thing to. I, I'm probably going to quote you on several of these things if you're okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in addition to to recording the interview, I think I'm going to specifically write several of these things down and use them in blog posts. Oh, uh, feel free. Yeah. Um. Uh. The no, but the and it's just it's just come from experience. Like I don't think I'm particularly uh, insightful so much as just I remember uh, certain types of pain pretty acutely. <laughs> um, but it's like, but yeah, when you're dealing with a, a company situation where you've got a bunch of people trying to all cooperate on the same task, the ability to um, to prioritize and communicate with stakeholders in a language they understand is is incredibly critical, as is the ability to parachute in here and there when you see somebody get a little bit stuck and not make progress for a day or two and so that you can help move them forward because those are teachable moments and if you if you throw them away on making somebody feel bad about themselves or <laughs> you know that like you've 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 effectively caused two problems right like no, number one you didn't you didn't um you didn't grow them as a developer and number two you've actually probably reinforced whatever insecurity they have coming into the situation to begin with. Those are, those are great observations. Um, yeah. So this, this may sound like the same question as the previous one, but just in case it doesn't, uh, mm. that was kind of talking about good versus bad in senior engineers. Uh, and, and I kind of led into it with asking about interviewing them. Mm. Um, other than what you've just said, which was great. Uh, is there anything else about sort of good versus bad senior engineers you've worked with? Can you think of, of sort of who were, the, who were the good ones versus the bad ones you've worked with? And again, you may have already answered. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the best engineers I've worked with um, on my team, I'll just name him just because like I have no problem uh, <laughs> praising somebody who deserves it. Uh, 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 my friend Michael Harold is really good at it because he is this fairly rare combination of incredibly competent, and incredibly empathetic as a teacher and he has a bit of a teaching background um so that's probably no uh no coincidence there but he has sort of this uncanny ability to start getting to the problem you're having and figure out what's the level of abstraction where the friction point is 
and how to kind of nudge you over that inflection point. And um, I've worked with a lot of people that are um, really smart and really accomplished, and they're not good at that part. I've also worked with people that were really, hey, let's figure it out together, but they, they didn't quite have the experience. So it's, it's two people kind of like struggling against a common foe, which is also yeah. very valuable. Yeah, but, it's more like pair programming, less like mentoring. But both yeah, valuable, yeah, but different. Yeah, but his, his ability to do both of those things at the same time and, and to gain the context really quickly makes him a very valuable mentor in my experience. Yeah, that, that does sound like it has a lot to do with his teaching experience. I mean, everything you just mentioned is, is a, a set of skills I'm used to associating with good teachers. Uh, my, my wife is a, is a very good teacher, and so I've, I've learned a lot from her. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Mm. Okay. Um, so if there were people out there listening and trying to think, you know, from kind of a junior, uh, junior engineering perspective, how do I mm -hmm. make it over the hump? either the, the initial hump to get hired or the hump to, to sort of go from junior engineer to just, you know, engineer without an adjective. Um, mm. Any particular advice you'd give them? Anything you think they should be looking for that they might not be thinking about or that, uh, that, that from your, your perspective with more, more experience, you might know a little more about? Yeah. Uh, I did a great, I, or I did a, a well-received talk um, a few years ago about things I wish I hadn't known when I started. And, nice. um, was it recorded? Can One I just put them, a link to it? Uh, I honestly, I stick it. I, I I need to do it for the camera and just stick it up on YouTube because it's be always been for for private occasions. Yeah, uh, like like uh, when we would have like a code school class come and and ah and, okay, you know, come through the company. Yeah. Um. But yeah, if you uh, have anything like that, I'd love to just link to it. But sorry, go ahead. You you no no this, no you no. Know, what no, you wish you'd done? No no problem. Uh. I think the number, I think a lot of what drives imposter syndrome is this idea that if you don't know it off the top of your head, then you're not good at it. And that's, there is a certain point where, yeah, you can see somebody like, um, you could see somebody like, uh, um, uh, it was, was it Dave Thomas? Maybe I saw it strange loop. Like he gave a talk about the Y combinator, building building up the y combinator in common lisp in emacs while he was talking and his mouth was not tracking what his hands were doing right it's one of the damnedest things i've ever seen in my life so clearly a person like that can build a lot of stuff off the top of their head like it's a lot there's a lot of it that's now just muscle memory or just information compression and they're just they're just they're just reaching for it yeah. And thinking you're, you're pretty sure it wasn't just a pre-recorded demo that was running while he talked about something in a slightly different way right <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was uh, mostly because like the typing would stop when his hands would move away from the keyboard temporarily. <laughs> like okay. it was, it All was, right. it was something. Um, yeah. So yes, absolutely. People like that are out there. Um, yeah. um, but most people aren't like that. Yeah. And you're generally not, you're generally not hired to do the things you know how to do off the top of your, so much as you're hired to use the context to solve somewhat novel problems yeah. that the business will encounter on a day to day. Yeah. So a really succinct way of putting it is the things you can figure out are more important than the things you already know, but the things you already know are the superpower that allows you to figure more things out. So that's why accruing more and more knowledge is so useful. Um, right. So if you can tolerate, learn to tolerate not knowing something, long enough to stick with it and figure it out, then that's basically, that's the trick. Yeah. And that's a skill I'm still working on. And that's yeah. a skill a lot of people I know are still working on. Yeah. Well, I, I assume we all keep working on that. I'm, <laughs> I hope I'm not as good at that skill as I will eventually get because, uh, man, not, not being better at it than I am feels like a handicap. And it's, it's not like it's, it's held me back, you know, on the career path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, and but in fairness, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have too. So anybody hearing this should should also take comfort from that fact as well, I think. You know, yeah. it's like well, I, w when I want to feel old, what I say is I've been a computer programmer more than half of the time there have been computer programmers in the world. <laughs> I I loved it when you I loved it, I love that part in the intro of the book because it's like, yeah, there's 
there it's a really young uh it's a in a lot of ways it's a really young discipline oh, absolutely <laughs> i mean and, and in other ways it pretends it's an even younger discipline because we're constantly forgetting things that people figured out 10 year 10 or 20 years ago <laughs> yeah someday i want to read i don't know history of like the early railroads or something and and find out if if that kind of amnesia for all the all the stuff you screw up right at the beginning is every field or if it's just us <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> um Honestly, I saw this really fascinating uh, video this morning because I'm, I'm on a uh, kick playing Classic Doom, um, and uh, they just you know ported the N6, the Nintendo 64 version to the PC, and it's it's a beautiful port and it's a lot nice. of fun to play. And yeah. I, YouTube was like, hey, maybe you'd like this one, and it was a, a it was a homebrew modder talking about the history of Doom ports. Yeah, and the reason it is so portable is because it's written in what he described as beautiful C code with well-built interfaces. So the bit that you actually have to wrestle with to make it work on a particular system is kind of a contained problem. And once you wrestle that to the ground, there's all this beautiful code you can more or less plug in. Yeah. Unless it's, you're just incredibly processor or space constrained otherwise. Right. What's well, it's a lot like what, uh, what they used to say about the Linux kernel where mm. once you've ported beyond a certain number of places, you have an extremely good idea architecturally what the right core center portable part is and what parts you have to port. And it also mm -hmm. means that after you've done that a few times, you know, having those things separated means you can look at an architecture and tell which parts of it are supposed to be different from everybody else and which parts mm -hmm. by doing it differently, they're, they're clearly just doing it wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You've got a, a, a sort of well-defined, here's, here's the right way to do it, and here's the things that you're supposed to change. And if you have to change mm -hmm. anything outside that, uh, you, you know you're working around something awkward. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and those kinds of things are signal, you know. And I think a lot of people, uh, I think a lot of people confuse for, they confuse what kind of signal they're getting. They're, they're, take, they're taking something and they're going, oh, this feels kind of grody or it feels frustrating wrong as opposed to oh maybe my approach is wrong or maybe or this being too long to figure out am i looking at it right like yeah. like what i've been thinking about a lot of years is that um all all hard problems are slow feedback loops in disguise that's a really good way and, to put it yeah it, well it's been helpful for me because like there's a few places there's a few integrational places i've worked uh, a complicated chunk of our system where it's like it's it's hard to test because it's so many side effects happening with systems we don't control yeah and those those are really th those are those are limitations of how we had to build something you know, yeah. at a point where we just needed to build it and it's like that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that the code's hard it means it means fully encapsulating the behavior in a test is hard. Yeah, it's when somebody's been engineering long enough, they get really good at taking those, like you say, those slow feedback loops, those things where mm -hmm. you've got a, a certain amount of noise built into the system. And so the hard part is figuring out that you only sort of control the results and turning yeah. that into a small tight loop that you control plus something that deals with the noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was, there was something you mentioned in that code interview you posted that uh, that kind of stuck with me this morning which was the the idea that um it's it's separating that signal from noise is actually a big chunk of what makes somebody effective at solving those problems because somebody will come to you and say like your stakeholder will come to you with a long laundry list of stuff they need and hiding in that avalanche of details is two or three really important hooks yeah. that actually make make all the difference mm -hmm. Yeah, I I wish there was some you know magical way to tell which was which, but it's uh, I, I've never found a way other than than just you know soldiering through it. It's the same problem yeah. as you know those old word problems that they used to give you. Like occasionally you'd get a really just sadistic math teacher who would give you mm -hmm. the kind of word problems where you had a bunch of things you didn't need in order to solve the problem, and you had to pick out which three things you needed, and those were always the worst. <laughs> Oh man, my uh, my first Java teacher. Uh, I guess he had just he was so battered and beaten by people taking his class who shouldn't have been taking his class that he had this whole thing in the um, in the uh, the the curriculum vitae that was like it was just like if I see spelling mistakes in your submission, that's worth this many points off. If you don't format your lock put so everything. It's this many points off. It was just like, 
and I just got through this whole thing and I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I was a much more temperamental person before I started meditating and I, <laughs> I and I, I got through it. I'm just like going, I'm like, uh, oh, okay. I was like, well, I'll, I, I, I was like, I'll either get bonus points or he'll just bounce me out of the class. If I was spending out spelling mistakes or actually in the syllabus he just sent us because they were like, <laughs> there were like four spelling of grammar mistakes in the part where he was telling us how he was going to bomb us from morbid if we submitted a <laughs> substandard work. <to> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, perfectionists are often kind of kind of hypocritical that way, and fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Coding style, I don't know. It's always it's always religion. Uh, there was a there was yeah. a, a professor I had at CMU, and and my favorite was that she was on a crusade against like Fubar and Baz as variable names. Like mm. she she would she would fail you if you had too many lines in your functions, or if your variable names were too few characters. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Um, that's, that's interesting. Like, it, cause it, I think you, if you squint, you could be forgiven for, or, or you, you could potentially forgive her just for, for saying maybe, maybe what she's, uh, she's trying to, uh, she's, she's railing against what she sees as a readability problem. Something I do yeah. relate to. Um, well so, I mean, her, her whole approach was actually to take several things to a ridiculous extreme for new coders that had not been doing it very long. Uh, uh, when I say okay. too few, when I say too many lines, the maximum number of lines which you could have and not lose points was four. Wow. And this was in C. This wasn't even in Ruby. Like you can, you oh, can wow. do a fair bit in four lines of Ruby if you're, if you're willing to try hard, but like totally. C, no, it's like, that's, that's a severe restriction. Um, that on the other that's hand, like homework into code golf, a kind of, but for number of lines instead of characters, it was weird. Like she right. wanted long variable names, uh, but you couldn't have all that many operations on the line. I don't know. It was it was weird code golf. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah with you know, playing blind with a hand tied behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but but uh, on that note, I mean, like something uh, something my father prejudiced towards. Uh, when I, I swapped careers was he said that, you know, the most of code is what it does to the reader. And as a side, as a nice side effect, it executes in business value. And I, I do think that that clearly, you can't always optimize for that, but I think it's a good thing to roar. And I think a lot of the design stuff that, you know, people Sandy Meadows me to, that's been really helpful for me has been like, it's, it's been, um, yeah, it's been a lot about, inter you know, uh, can you, can you change and extend this code over time without breaking it? Is it, a lot of that really does come down to tight readability. Like your, your really legibility and good design frequently, even if they don't core, even if they, there's not causal relationship, they frequently correlate, I think. Yeah. There was a, there was a section where you were sort of cutting out. I couldn't tell if you specifically mentioned Sandy Metz, but I'll say the point you just yeah. made, and it sounded a little like you did. The point you just made is a very her sort of point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's mostly about readability. And I, I don't think I got that the first couple of times I it took a running leap at it, but the more presentations you watch of hers, like that's, a big chunk of what she's saying is it's like, you know, you, you want your code. It's about shrinking concepts into their smallest, most concrete um, version so that it's easy to, it's easy to read. We, we refactored a chunk of uh, our system that um, um, is really important recently. And it was a, a kind of an example of, of, behavior had built up in different points in the application it was turning it had turned into a bit of a distributed unnamed feature and we we pulled it together and when we did a presentation on the command pattern we were using it was just like i said you know this is gonna look a little bit complicated but that's okay because this behavior is complicated and it kind of has to be like so but this is an improvement because now it's in one place and we can kind of, we can, because we're using a command pattern, we can read it as a set of steps as opposed to, you know, um, thinking of it as event pinball, like moving around a system to all these different un apparently unrelated places. Yeah. It's, it's always better if you can at least put the steps, you know, in order in one place. Absolutely. Distributed Absolutely. unnamed feature. I, I like that.
yeah. <laughs> um that's uh uh you know and that those those again those friction if you're if you're junior that friction feels like something has gone wrong and if you're insecure you're going to tend to blame yourself and instead sandy metz is just be there to put a, a calm reassuring hand on your shoulder and say sweetie that's just shotgun surgery and we've been doing it since the 70s <laughs> yeah and that, that's pretty much exactly how she'd say it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, even if you've done something wrong, it's a little like, you know, I, I do a lot of cooking, so I tend to think in cooking metaphors. Um, mm -hmm. You can you can overspice something, and if you're new to it, you're probably going to have trouble figuring out how to fix that. But the way you've done that wrong doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a person in danger of eating a very salty pasta. That's, that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's certain types of problems. I think that, uh, you know, there's certain types of problems. I think that are their chief value ends up being their memorability just because it's like, well, if you, if you, um, if you set that side of the business on fire, but it turns out you've got good backups, well, you're probably not going to make that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a great Henry Ford story about how uh, one of one of his subordinates that he just put in charge of, of one of his major factories um, screwed up the the supply line completely in a way that wound up costing mm. him something like four hundred thousand dollars like just screwed oh, man. completely stopped production for a significant period of time and uh, one of uh, one of the random business people that Ford spent time around said I assume you fired that guy and Ford said fired him I just spent four hundred thousand dollars training him <laughs> <laughs> that is such a oh Oh, I'm definitely using that. That is such a good way to put it because it's like, yeah, like if you think again, it's a, if, if you're, if you go into a situation looking to punish somebody out of frustration, you're wasting yeah. an opportunity. Yeah. And, and it, you know, at least you got that part right. It was just like, well, I just, I just paid all this money. I might as well get something for it. <laughs> yeah. And now Ford was, Ford was very level headed about these things. You know, I'd, I'd praise him. I'd praise him almost without limit if it weren't for the fact that he did a lot of things like, uh, I, yeah, I think he yeah. was one of the ones that, that spent sent a lot of money to, uh, to to the Kaisers in Germany and stuff. So it's a, it's a little bit mixed, but yeah, pu published a lot of anti-Semitic propaganda. He was he was kind of a conspiracy nut, unfortunately. It's uh, but it's, he was he was pretty solid on the business side. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 fair, <laughs> fair. He uh, and you know he was uh, he was one of those people that knew how to. Um, I mean, honestly, I think you could probably refer to the Model T as kind of an interesting example of like a, an MVP, right? You Absolutely. Know, like he, he was famous for saying you can have it in any color as long as it's black, you know? Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, or, or, or maybe a min minimum lovable product. That's kind of a term we've sort of started embracing too. Because yeah. You know, think, it's with, with MVP, we've, we've finally been doing that long enough that we've managed to... Uh, we, we, we've managed to sometimes overdo the minimal. You know, usually you don't have to tell people don't overdo the minimal because human nature is such that it's hard to even get to the right amount of minimal, let alone overdo it. But occasionally we can manage. <laughs> well, one of our values at Flywheel is um, we have several very important values, I think. And the culture for our company, I think, is a competitive advantage. Um, one of the the one of the values that I really appreciate is, you know, we are excellent to each other as part of where our no jerks policy comes from. Um, uh, basically, we it, it's also why so many of the senior engineers that I know on the staff make themselves so available, available for people when they see them struggling. Um, and it's now part of how we're we're actively beginning to pursue training people and leveling them up. You know, we we just we just hired a senior engineer from Java who isn't familiar with Ruby and we're putting time and effort into tr trying to make her a good Rubyist before we turn her loose on features, not because we don't trust her to come up to speed on her own, but, but you know, we want to invest in her. And I think that's wonderful. Um, you know, I mean, but, if, if you've got a good senior person, they can, they can learn your new technology a lot faster than you can take somebody who knows your technology and make them a good senior person. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a very, it's a very smart way to invest, I think. And, but uh, we also, uh, design matters is one of our core principles. And I think that's, to me, that's the distinction between like a minimum viable product versus a minimum lovable product, because you're considering the experience of using something to be part of its core value that you're delivering. And I think that's very important. And I think it's something our designers do very well. Yeah. I, and I think it is a somewhat different thing in design than it is in a lot of the, the sort of more technical side or the marketing side. You know, very often mm -hmm. with the marketing side or the technical side, if it's a little rough, you can still get fairly good 
understanding of whether you did something pretty good or something that's that's not so good. And yeah, with design, if it's not fairly polished, sometimes you just can't tell. You know, you can put it mm. in front of people, but the 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 reaction you get isn't necessarily valuable if it isn't already pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, and we're we're employing. Uh, I think they're embracing feedback loops in this way too, though, because it's like it's really useful to be able to do things like you know, you go in and you ask somebody to do something, and you you don't help them, you don't you know nudge them at all. Like you you like is that watching people attempt to use your product is is a humbling, valuable uh, feedback loop. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, and 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 it's it's uh, and and we're we're beginning to try to we're you know like on the technical side we're talking about design as well because you know the, one of the problems you run into when you grow code under combat conditions you know it's like if we don't if we don't ship this capability by the end of the week we won't close this valuable new customer right yep. like you know it's like that comes up all the times so oh, you, sure. when when you're still a struggling startup so it's like. But you, when you grow code that way, you end up with distributed unnamed features. And the, the thing that is most unfortunate about them is that they lack design. There's not, there's not the intention to say, hey, this. what if we named this? And what if we actually described the behavior? <laughs> and what if we thought about the ergonomics of how another developer would need to use it? And those are the ways I talk to people about um, um, I did a uh, I did a thing called the Ruby Crash Course. Um, actually, pro I actually uh, beta tested it on a bunch of non our non technical staff, and uh, in forty minutes we went from um, we went from um, it's, we we used Fizzbuzz as the toy problem. We went from like you know thirty lines of puts one, puts two, puts fizz, etc. And it, you know we went from that to like a well factored encapsulated class with some of the functionality moved into a module and all this stuff. And yeah. I discovered if I didn't, if I told people why I was doing things and I didn't tell them that what I was doing was considered to be technical or abstract, that they just believed me. And yeah. it, it turns out Ruby is actually kind of a well-built language. And if you show people why you're, why you're doing something, understand it. Yeah. Uh, I, the when I've seen things be too abstract and people not did not stick with people, it's because they didn't feel the pain of why we were doing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. The Lisp folks actually, uh, back in the day, a long time ago now, um, had a similar experience where you could, you could teach people Lisp if they had no idea what Lisp was or, or almost anything about it, because if you don't mm -hmm. tell them it's a weird technical thing, mostly they can just pick it up. Um, but yeah, if you tell them it's a hard thing first, then usually they don't. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I remember John Rezik saying that, like when he was doing the Khan Academy stuff. He's just like, mm. I've figured out if you start beginners and you give them a general introduction to prototypal inheritance, nobody has a problem. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's it, prototype and prototypal inheritance is always weird for me because some of the first things I ever used worked that way, and so it was probably the hardest thing I ever I found found as far as figuring that out was to mm. eventually realize that I've been doing inheritance two completely different ways and to sort of tease out what the actual differences were. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, do you know uh, LPC and LP MUD from mm. old, old games back in the day? Uh, no, so no. M MUDs were like 1970s to early 80s era to online text games, like yeah, massively multiplayer text games before there were massive yeah. multiplayer games. Um, and so, yeah, LPC was one of the, the big languages used to build MUDs, and it was prototype inheritance. Okay. It was, yeah, which actually makes a lot of sense for, uh, for a game, um, because very often you, you do want sort of data objects inheriting from other data objects in, a, hmm. in, in pretty much exactly that way. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I... Uh... Yeah, I'm. I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm looking forward to um, um, getting more from this little community you've put together to support re rebuilding Rails and mastering software technique. Um, uh, we're we've got a lot of people. We're and by the way, we're really uh, glad that you're going to be speaking. Um, yes, at our uh, meetup in in, uh, in in May. May. Yeah. Uh, we're going to make that link available to anybody who wants cool. to join. So um, and fabulous. In fact, if, if you're interested in seeing what you're in for, I'll send you the link to the the one we're doing tomorrow night. Um, I although love I know that, it's yeah. going to be it's going to be past your bedtime in, in Inverness. 
Well, I was going to say, if it's a recording link, I'll happily like watch the recording afterwards. But yeah, I may not. I may not be able to watch it live. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> yeah. But um. But no, I really, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Um. And I know that's it's a lot of people are kind of uh, excited about it. We've got a, a the person from um uh, unabridged who's been kind of acting as a professional trainer for a new hiring class. Uh, got real excited when I said uh, you were going to be uh, you were going to be uh, speaking. So. Um, um, so I really appreciate all of that. And, um, yeah, if I, uh, get any of the talks I've done, uh, up online, I'll be happy to send, send you links. Fabulous. Uh, yeah. I'm, useful. I'm, I'm very happy to, you know, point people at them to link anything relevant to, yeah. Like no, one of the joys of Ruby is where we're really pretty good about, uh, you know, working hard to teach new people and to kind of, kind of bring new people on board and point and point, yeah. point at each other and all that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I still think we could we could still do better doing even more of that. <laughs> I mean, I, we're better than than almost any other community I've found in programming, but it's, mm. that's not because we've you know reached the end and we're there. It's it's like, right. You know, yeah, we could still do better. <laughs> I think one of the first uh, professional, uh, one of the first uh, functional talks I saw yeah. that was written in Ruby was uh, Jessica Kerr at Ruby mm. Midwest. She's and, awesome. Uh, she's great. Yeah. And she, she, I remember she started the whole talk was just like, I learned Ruby so I could give this talk because I love the Ruby community. Like of all of the different programming communities I've hung out in, like they're, they're, they're so warm and welcoming and friendly. And it may, just makes me want to come be part of this community, even if I don't write a lot of Ruby code for my day job. Yep. Yeah. It's someday I'll find a language I like better than Ruby for the things I'm doing. And it'll be kind of sad because mm -hmm. it's not, I mean, it, I love the Ruby language. It's a wonderful language, but yeah, at this point, a lot of why I'm in the community is not the language, even though it's a good language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the, I'm, I'm in the community for the community. Also the language is good. <laughs> I was at a wedding once and the bridesmaid said, heck, I would have married him just for his family. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> 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 That's a great way to put it. Yeah, like that. <laughs> uh, well, I really appreciate uh, getting the chance to talk to you, Noah. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to um, um, catching up with you more online and having you uh, having you come uh, talk to our little meetup in May. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, yeah, okay. thank you very much. It's been wonderful to uh, to talk to you about this. And there have been a lot of really good things here. I, I appreciate that. I'm, well, again, thank you. probably going to pull a bunch of quotes out because there's a lot of good yeah. stuff here. <laughs> If anything useful, feel feel free. I look forward to seeing like what you what you're going public. Uh, all right, have a good one. You too.